in 2004, Vern merged in the change from uh, roaming. It turned out it was a, it was a good first run. <laughs> it was very limited in, in what it did, though. It really, it only did SMB1, and it was architected in a sort of odd style. It, it was, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it for anyone that understands, but it used bin pack for like doing unit parsing, but then the larger structure of the protocol is actually sort of the flow control was done through C++, which is a little strange. And I Personally, for me, I like to avoid C++ and analyzers because that's just a good way to add a vulnerability into Bro. Um, so speaking of server, server message block, I went to Wikipedia. I thought that that's probably how a, a good way to start the presentation is so. What is server message block? It, don't call it SIFS either. It's not SIFS. That was an old name, and Microsoft officially deprecated that name. Um, the, so it's not the common internet file system. But this is actually, uh, it's, it's a really old protocol. Microsoft didn't create the original version of it. It was someone else who I should have looked up who it was. They adopted it and extended it, as you might expect, and caused a lot of uh, consternation for anyone trying to use it. The, the most important thing here, though, I think, is that if you look at it, it says an application layer network protocol, fine, no problem. Used for shared access to files. Yeah, OK, that's getting scarier. Printers, oh god. Serial ports, oh my god. Miscellaneous communication between nodes on a network. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> it's just even reading the first sentence in this thing is, is just completely horrifying from a, from a uh, uh, implementation perspective. And then you find out how many versions are there. And you start going, what the hell? Why, is the, why are they doing this to me? And then you ignore the fact Okay, well, everything, so, so to sort of calm that down, everything after 2.0 is sort of like extensions on 2.0. So really, it's 2.0 plus. The other things pretty much work. They, they, they added things like encryption into some of the later ones and stuff. But then Wikipedia forgot to mention a big, horrible part of this, which is SMB1. That's the bad one. SMB2 is really a good protocol. That was Microsoft created that. It's a decent protocol. Apple is actually adopting it. They've, uh, Apple announced they're getting rid of uh, Apple filing protocol. They're switching to SMB2 because it's a good protocol, and making these protocols is a nightmare. So this is a true statement. In most of your networks, your whole entire company does every single thing it does, period, over SMB. Like I'm sure there are corporate networks. You can sit there and watch. There's other protocols. They don't really matter. Everything that matters is SMB. Every system administration task, every print job, every file transfer, someone hits save in Excel, goes over the network. Every single thing happens over SMB. It's really an unbelievably pervasive protocol, especially as like now Apple adopting SMB. Suddenly, yes, your Macs fit into that same statement. Everything is doing SMB. It's unbelievable. But we're going to come back to that in a minute because there's some other things to talk about. So in the implementation of the SMB analyzer, there was some pain. <laughs> there were a lot of extremely late nights, a number of 5 AM sort of nights where you sleep for an hour and a half because you've got to get kids to school. Um, uh, it, it was a long discovery. So this, this is BINPAC, the Binary Protocol Analyzer Compiler, which is how a lot of the more modern analyzers and some of, a lot of the analyzers in Bro are written in BINPAC. It's a way essentially of avoiding um, buffer overflows in protocol parsing, because if you do things in C to do protocol parsing, you're just asking to, to, to add a vulnerability, as, as I know several people in the audience are familiar with, um, with not adding vulnerabilities. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's just very hard. This makes it much easier. The thing in here that I wanted to point out, so this is SMB1. You can see these are like unit definitions. So it's like a unit of the protocol being defined here. And you can see there's like on the left, you have a name of a value to be parsed and then the type to be parsed. So like that first one, word count, it's like, OK, parse 8-bit uh, uint, and there you go. It parses that. And x, there's another structure, another type called SMB and x that then gets parsed there that is however long it is. And I can't even remember. It's maybe 32 bytes, uh, 30, 32 bits. Um, the thing in particular I wanted to point out on this 
is SMB1 is a really old protocol. Long ago, people did not have terabyte, five terabyte hard drives. And so it kind of had this thing like, why would you write to byte, you know, to why would you seek five gigs into a file and then do a write? So they were, the, the idea was that, uh, this, is, this is actually a bad example, but do you see, the, the thing I'm trying to point out here, I guess, is it's got data len low and data len high, and they're separated by another value. Microsoft realized that they needed 32-bit integers for this case, but they had defined the protocol using 16-bit integers, and so they were like, uh, we've got some reserved bytes that we're not using in the protocol, so those are the other 16 bits, and they just defined it. And this stuff is not really clearly defined anywhere. There's a lot of like, you know, oh, my PCAP doesn't parse right. Ugh. And then you like dig and probably look at the Wireshark analyzer and then go, oh, they figured it out and whatever. Um, so you can actually see that we parse data len low, data len high, and then down at the bottom, we're actually defining data len, which is the, data, the actual data length. And it's a 32-bit integer. And so we take data len high, shift it 16 bits to the left, and then add data len low to it. And that's your actual data length instead of just using a 32-bit integer to begin with because that would have been thinking too far ahead. And it's hard, to be fair. It's hard to think ahead. Um, so there's another one. This is SMB2. Um, just another thing that is, this is more pain in SMB. So what would everyone assume that an SMB2 write request is? You're telling it, hey, write these 32 bytes to that file. Tricks on you, because guess what? What if that's a pipe? Maybe you're not talking to a file. You're like, write it to a file. Ha, 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 I'm actually talking to Microsoft SQL, but I'm doing it through a write. It's not a file. So we suddenly have to go, is this a pipe? Or is this a file? Because if it's a pipe, don't send it to the file framework. Send it over to the pipe stuff so you can do DC RPC analysis on it. It's yet another thing. I, like, I had no idea how any of this stuff worked. And so it was this slow, long discovery process of how to do this. And then, so the immediate next question that comes up, all right, so I know conceptually, like I know that my car works by, you know, the, the engine fires and the pistons go up and down. You're like, okay, I know that if it's a pipe, I need to send it over here. But then you go, uh, how, how do I know if it's a pipe? I don't even know how to tell if something is a pipe. Oh, there's multiple ways of figuring it out. So we actually have um, the tree that was mapped. So you have to map a share, and you can map like a pipe share, and you know ahead of time, you're like, OK, things that are done over this share are pipes that it's talking to. So we actually have to, I had to add code to make it deal with all that and understand that it's talking to a pipe. And it was a big nightmare. But anyway, this works. You don't have to worry about it. It's, n it's nice from that perspective. But even after, so there's all this pain of just getting the parsing working, but there was still a huge question. What do you log? You've got this protocol, and you're like, all right, here's a protocol. It's HTTP. You've got a request reply. And you're like, OK, what do we log? Request reply pair, some data from those two, whatever. It's fine. SMB, what is it? Well, it's file or random you know, protocol, whatever. You know, it's just sort of like everything. You're like, what's it do? Everything in the world. What do we log from that? I don't know. And, and so we actually worked on this for a really long time. We asked, what did we log? I have no idea. I still don't even know if our logs are right. I have absolutely no clue. The one thing you do know to begin with is, what are our raw materials? What are the lumber that we cut down that then we can build a log house? Oh, god, that works. I never even thought of that. Anyway, so um, <laughs> here's, should have put a tree on there. Um, so here are, uh, the, the, these, these are events. And these are all events in 2.5 that you can write a bro script, and you can handle these events, and you can do something with them. Good luck if you decide to do that. And I hope you do, because it's scary. But uh, there are stuff you could do here, I'm sure. Um, but the, the, the downside to that, though, is a lot of times you have to really know the SMB and SMB2 protocols to be effective with them. And, those are scary protocols. They're, they're, file, they're, they're everything protocols, so they're, by definition, scary. 
Um, so here's, here's what the logs are for 2.5. Um, SMB mapping, one of the kind of obvious logs is whenever a host goes, I'm going to go out to the remote machine, and I want to map that drive, that share. That's pretty clear, like that's probably worthwhile ma uh, logging that a host, a host has mapped a share. So that's what SMB mapping.log is. Typically on most networks, this is not turning out to be a really huge log because, um, because you don't see the drive mapping that much. Someone gets into work, they turn the computer on, map a share, and it's mapped all day, and then they disconnect, so you don't really see that much going on there. Um, SMB files is, is a little different. Um, it, there's this sort of defined set of actions. An action could be like a file open or a file close or um, a rename or a delete, things like that. That goes in there. there and I do need to explain a little bit of, uh, uh, create the distinction between files log and SMB files log. Files log, which is the normal bro log file that a lot of you have probably seen, is... Um, it's meant for when a file is transferred, and Bro says, okay, I see the bytes, you know, it's all the bytes go there, and I can extract the file and do whatever. SMB files log, you, never, you did not necessarily see the file itself get transferred. You could see that something referenced that file, or that something deleted that file. Because if you tell, you're like, hey, server, delete that file. Bro never saw that file. You just saw it say to delete that, but it's, would anyone disagree that it's worthwhile to see that? Like, you, of course, you want to see if someone deletes something remotely or renames it. Unfortunately, we only have delete and rename for SMB2 right now. But a lot of networks are moving to SMB2 very quickly. But you do still see a lot of SMB1. Um, and then to continue, remember, this is the kitchen sink of protocols. So you've got remote procedure calls. And in, in the Microsoft world, it's called DCE RPC. And I should have looked up what DCE stands for, so when someone asked what that stands for, I could answer, but I did not look that up. So it stands for something, but RPC stands for Remote Procedure Calls. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, there's, there's mechanisms for encoding arguments in them and doing remote, uh, remote calls, and that's basically it. So what actually ends up in that log is... Um, an end, you get like a, you get the IP address information, so you have like kind of the connection information, and timestamp, and then you'll get an endpoint, and that's essentially like the URL or the, the not URL, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, um, the DLL on the remote side, kind of that you're talking to, or the serve, I guess the service on the remote side you're talking to, and then you'll get a function name, and it's like the function name, and it'll be like the WinReg service, and you're calling some you know registry key update write so something or other. And right now, none of those are being parsed. Um, I'm hoping that in a future release, we'll be able to do some more parsing there and add like 15 billion events for all the different things that happen over that. Um, and then Vlad, when, when Vlad was working on this, he had, Vlad, where are you? There you are. Vlad has worked on uh, SMB along with me. It's quite a bit. And uh, I think you can talk to him if you'd like to. And he will agree that SMB is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, he originally had added the, uh, the NTLM analyzer, and it's not integrated in other places yet except for into SMB. We, I do want to get it eventually integrated into HTTP analyzer and stuff like that so that if someone does NTLM over HTTP, you'll see that. But um, it is there. It shows if they logged in, if they authenticated, if it was successful, and some other stuff. And we'll look at some logs now. So SMB mapping is... Uh, it just shows when, when a disk is mapped. So you have like the, the name of it, the share name. Um, the, the IPC one, you see over at the right side, it says pipe. That field, it, so you've got these, these fields. The first, I cut out the connection stuff on this one. But the fields are path, which is that first one. And a lot of times you'll see uh, service and native file system empty. And then um, share type. It'll have the best guess that Bro can make as to what the share type is. Sometimes we don't, we just like miss the message where you would actually know the share type, so it has to sort of make a guess. But anyway, the thing in here I wanted to particularly point out was these two. This was yet another one of those oh crap discoveries. Uh, those are actually on the same TCP connection, so Bro mapped two shares. So you see one connection, and you're like. The, the easy, nice thing from a developer perspective, I guess, would be to say, okay, this connection mapped the share, so I know now anything that happens over this connection is talking to files on this share. 
well, they added multiplexing and you could do like multiple transfers simultaneously to multiple different shares. And so there's like multiplexing ID that you have to pay attention to. Uh, but it really makes things complicated from an analyzer perspective because suddenly each message, you need to know what they're actually talking to. And it's, it's really kind of uh, difficult. But anyway, that was another discovery of this whole multiplexing and uh, multiple share mapping and being able to talk to different shares uh, simultaneously. Um, so SMB files has, uh, this is the one that I was talking about that is like actions that happen on remote files and you've got what the action was, the path, the name, the size, previous name for, for rename, um, and the timestamps. Huh. Okay, well I have an example. Apparently I just didn't finish that slide. It's interesting, I thought I had finished that. Um, so anyway, but there's an, there's an example in just a second that's kind of great, so we'll get back to that. So DCE RPC log, this is like what I was saying. Um, these top two, the LSA RPC is talking to the LSA RPC endpoint, and the operation is LSA R open policy two. And these are things you can like look these things up and find out what's actually happening, what these are for and what they do. So you know like uh, the service, the SRV service or whatever it's called, NetR share get info. You can actually type that into Google and probably find out what it does. Um, and eventually, I hope that we'll be able to have events for those so that you can actually get the arguments that were given when the call was made and things like that, but that's not available yet. NTLM log, it's got a uh, username, host name, domain name, success, and status. Uh, there might be some bugs with this still. I hope not. I've been trying to get all the bugs out of it. Uh, generally, I think it works pretty well, but... Um, Certainly, the one thing that I don't want anyone to feel like is that if they don't understand the output, that don't assume it's not a bug. There's, very, there's very, a very high possibility of bugs existing in this. It, it's sort of like implementation bugs, where it's, uh, it, or, uh, like it's giving you the incorrect output. So that's most of the structure of things. But back to business runs on SMB, I'll just give everybody a second to absorb this. This is the SMB files log. Um, no, this was me formatting it to make it easier to read. Um, I don't think that whoever is working on that Excel file wants the incident responders to have that Excel file because the incident responder is probably in that Excel file. And the interesting thing is imagine if the incident responder is like, well, you know, Excel files are interesting because, you know, maybe attacks happen over them sometimes. And so maybe the incident responder is like, well, as a rule of thumb, we extract Excel files. So it suddenly opens this sort of Pandora's box of questions where suddenly the business says, do we want that? Or it opens this other question of, well, the incident responder says, well, I see they've been, this person working on this has been saving it over and over and over again for like weeks. Let me diff my name in that over the weeks and see how my salary, my, my, my raise for next year changed over the last three weeks. Why did my raise go down? And suddenly it brings up all these horrible questions in the business. But this is the whole point about business runs on SMB. Literally, as the, as the next year's raise pools are being created, where is it being done? SMB. As attackers are pivoting across your networks, where is it being done? SMB. As uh, systems are being managed with group policy objects, where is it being done? SMB. As um, people are exfiltrating data off your networks that are insider threat people, which I, I, you know, whatever that means. But where are they doing it? SMB. Like literally just everything happens over SMB. People are doing print, um, printing to your printers. Where is that happening? SMB. It's just everything happens over SMB. And it, it puts incident responders, I think, in a sort of weird position, but the visibility is worth it, I think. And um, Yeah, it, I'm, I'm sure it probably is. It, the interesting thing I think about this is that it can be, um, you know, I, I, to be fair, I guess it's probably a very similar problem, actually. But it's just weird, though, when you've got, like, 
I, this, oh my God, yeah, stuff like this is just, it's, it's just mind-boggling to see it. And you're like, oh, geez, this put me in a really weird position because I want to open that file, and yet I shouldn't. <laughs> um, so it, it also, just, just to talk about it a little bit, because I think it's valuable, the SMB files log does have these other things, mod times modified, access created, so it's access changed. It's, so it's Mac times. And so you don't have to see the file transferred even. In this case, the file was renamed, or it could be deleted, or it could be um, something else. It, you actually have t historical timestamps for files on your SMB server. So you can imagine if you have a compromise or something on an SMB server, and you've been running the SMB analyzer, you actually can go back through your logs and find out timestamps on these files that people have been touching historically. So if this is data not on this computer anymore, like that server, you can you know, do forensics on the disk and look at the disk, and you have Mac times for the point in time when you turn that server off. But if you're running this, you actually have Mac times on that server historically. You can say, on August 1st at noon, what were the timestamps on this file? Like, before the compromise happened, what were the timestamps on this file? And then at, as things went on, when did they change and things like that. So it is sort of another interesting thing. I, I've, no one's used it this way yet for anything, but I have a funny feeling this is going to turn out to be really useful. So um, just kind of going more ideas, because there's like a million things you could do. Oh, you, you could map it all together. Um, <laughs> so more ideas. Search for finance, tax, accounting, backup, audit, HR, merger, acquisition. Literally, just grep for that stuff. It's crazy. You could you could create honeypot directories and just you could create a directory that would match those and just let yourself know if those ever get touched. It could be worthwhile. Even, and I'll, I I don't. The insider threat thing, I'm sort of conflicted about that because it's sort of like detecting people doing their jobs in some sense, you know, from a, visit, from a usage perspective. But who knows? I mean, this is certainly a possibility there. Um, analyze GPO policies. You see all of this stuff. There are just I and I files that are sent around. It's all visible. I, and I don't even know there. There was one case I was working with someone. We actually saw their help desk creating... BitLocker keys for newly provisioned systems, and they would save the BitLocker recovery PDF on an SMB share. We're like, oh, sh let's just extract all of those, and then we'll have all of those, like an extra copy of them, just in case. So you, you're actually seeing all of this stuff that users are like, all right, it's secure and safe. You know, the system administrators would not have set it up in an insecure way and whatever. And, but then, you know, the security team is sitting there and like, thank you, BitLocker recovery keys. Yep, okay. Um, ransomware detection. There was the talk from Fox IT, certainly. It turns out that's going to be a very hard topic, I think. <laughs> because what happens, Bro detects exactly what you told it to detect. The problem is specifying exactly what you want it to detect. It's, it's sort of the traditional problem that we always encounter with Bro, which is it detects exactly what you told it to. You were just not precise enough. Um, so things like file hash detection, if you load the SMB analyzer in 2.5 and you have indicators of compromise and you've loaded them in, in, into the Intel framework, that already works. You don't even have to do anything because it all feeds, uh, files that are transferred feed through the file analysis framework and it all feeds upstream and hits all the right places that it needs to hit. So if you want to use it right now, um, you can use the Git Master 2.5 beta or 2.5 when it's released. All you have to do is add load protocols slash SMB to local.bro. And it's actually in there already in the one for 2.5. You just have to uncomment it. We decided to leave it out because it's a lot of code. Um, the, the generated C++ code from the SMB analyzer is, it's probably about 20 or 24,000 lines of code, something like that. It's all generated, though, from those bin pack files. Um, but I, I suspect in 2.6 we'll probably have it enabled by default, like most protocol analyzers that we trust. So again, if you want to load it, just load protocols SMB. Are there any questions? I have a funny feeling there will be. <laughs> yeah. 
they're not logged or parsed or anything. Essentially, all we're log all, all that is happening right now is it is. Um, so the question was, DC RPC arguments are not logged, things like that. Um, they're not logged because there's like thousands and thousands of these functions, and there is a project from Samba called PIDL that takes the interface description libraries and outputs Samba code, and they've put a front end on it for Wireshark that outputs Wireshark C so that they could support it, and we'll probably do a similar thing. So I'm hoping that in a future release, you will actually see, um, you will actually see uh, those, like tons of events for those things in Bro, but not, not yet. Um, the, you see that? We don't have support for that. It was, I played with it at one point, and I got a partial analyzer written, but it needs integrated better. But no, if, if someone is doing, like for instance, Microsoft SQL over SMB, you won't see anything from that. You'll actually, I think it'll actually possibly look like file rights. You can submit a patch. <laughs> it's horrible. It's so bad. Anyway, I think, I think there was another question. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it does. For, for DCE RPC, we actually support five different transport mechanisms for DCE RPC right now. There's raw DCE RPC, which is like the 135, I don't even know what port it is. It's like 135, 137, 139. You see it on higher ports too when it hits, there's an EP mapper service and you'll see, it basically did port mapping and so it opens up a port on a high, a service on a high port. Bro identifies it there automatically anyway with DPD and we'll start doing analysis on it. But, um, uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. You, you see that stuff happening. Um, yeah, so the question was, it, does it open the door for like exchange decoding? And yeah, it definitely does. Uh, I don't know when they added it exactly. The, the thing that's hard for me is I haven't used Windows. I'm closing up on 20 years of not using Windows. And so I know how all this stuff works on the bottom, but I have no idea how to use any of it or at like, a, anyway. So I, like I know how it all works underneath, but I think the re, no one turns on encryption for SMB. I, I haven't. Actually, does anyone know that you do in your organization? Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard and no one turns it on. Yeah, that's, that's kind of been my understanding. I looked up once how to do it and they were like, click here and put a thing here and it was like, it was very involved and I was like, yep, no sysadmin is gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what, all you're asking for is for it to break because there's actually very little threat, I believe, like from having unencrypted. Like I don't think sysadmins are like, that's a threat to the business. But I don't know, maybe bro is going to start that discussion among sysadmins. I have no idea. Probably not, but I guess that's good for anyone relying on that data. Yeah. Uh, so the question is about having any sense of performance, that it's a lot of new stuff. Um, not really. Uh, the people that are running it seems to be working for them. Uh, it's, it's really hard to, it's very hard to answer the question. Um, I guess I don't know. I mean, the biggest thing is just going to be people running it and saying, yep, it works for me. I mean, like, I, it's, it's too hard to know how much of a performance impact that it's going to have. There wasn't a ton of attention during development placed on uh, making it run as fast as we possibly could. But on the other hand, I mean, we try to avoid doing stupid stuff. Uh, well, if you did that, assuming it's an actual switch, which pretty much everything is going to be, you would have to like uh, do a switch attack or something to get everything to go through you. Uh, but normally, this is on networks. It's probably at this level going to be span ports because it's things like, you know, coming into a top of rack switch where there is a uh, where there is a um, SMB server installation. Or maybe it's going to be at like a choke point outside at the edge of your data center, so you see all these clients from your network coming in to talk to the data center stuff. Um, I haven't done operational stuff for years, so <laughs> so I can't answer that question for myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the Intel framework is not not that big. The uh, so for files at least it works because the SMB. Parser, the SMB analyzer forwards files into the file analysis framework, and the file analysis framework is integrated with the Intel framework. So that's what happens. There, there's more integration that can happen there over time, but it's lower priority and probably would be less helpful than just file hashes and stuff immediately. I, I expect this is going to keep evolving for some number of years off in the future. I, there's another question uh, with crits. 
Uh, I did some integration there once a long time ago, but uh, that is not related to SMB, and that could be talked about separately. But uh, yeah, there's been some. What is the zone identifier? <laughs> you may have to show me. Oh, yeah, that shows up in a separate file. Yeah, I'm kind of at a disadvantage with a lot of this stuff because I haven't used Windows for so long. I don't actually know what people are doing. I just know what's actually happening. <laughs> so I have to, I've had to ask people um, questions a number of times. I'm like, how would, you, how would this happen? Like, what would happen in the UI that would make this happen on the network? And I don't always get answers to that. <laughs> ask Vlad about that. <laughs> He's, he's asking about NTLM hashes being visible in user space, in, in script space, essentially, and I, they're not actually right now. I thought I was reading about that the other day, and I thought about making that change, and I didn't, but whatever. Could be done. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Thank you.